This is BBC Radio 5 Live. A research by the eating disorder charity Beat suggests over half of men with an eating disorder have never had any treatment. It's thought the illness is affecting over 300,000 men in the UK. Dave Chorner joins us, uh, author and uh, comedian. Uh, you you went through mm-hmm. a lot of this in a in a in a in a very big way. Um, just to talk us through your your story. I started developing anorexia when I was sixteen, seventeen, but I didn't realise I got a problem. And everyone around me sort of kept on saying, "Oh, look, you know, mate, you need to get this sorted out." My mum was crying and screaming. But this was the you the. the the symptoms of this, if you like, were were what sort of not just basically not eat. Well, you know what, eating disorders aren't that much to do with food. So it was con- consistent exercising, consistent calorie counting. I was skipping school to weigh myself. Like obviously because I wasn't getting the nutrients, huge mood swings. I wasn't able to concentrate on things. I was constantly tired. I was using coffee. I started buying things off the internet in order to sort of get rid of food i think there's a whole range of things to look out for uh but i just never associated what i was doing with eating disorders eating disorders seemed very extreme especially anorexia and also all of the stories was that something at your school that girls that girls got was that (laughs) yeah i i actually know a girl in my school that did uh have anorexia and i suppose yeah it was one of those things look bottom line i think a lot of these things like with mental health it was a story that you might see in eastenders etc it wasn't something that i thought affected blokes and sort of normal blokes like me and what led you to get help then well it was actually really sort of long path it took me like three or four years to firstly realize i got a problem and one of the things that really helped was someone who'd had an eating disorder came up to me and said look i've had bulimia three or four times i kind of see the signs have you ever thought that you've had an but that wasn't a gp though no that was a uh, that was a mate i got a, a job working at a boarding school and all of the food was sort of created for you so it was just kind of pizza pasta chips there's no calorie count you can make your own food and i started to Unthread, but I think what was really important about this was this was the first time anyone had asked me if I thought I might have a need, sort of rather than telling me. Okay, so had you been? Okay, so but had you had you sort of tried to access any help beforehand, or is it did you talk to a? Have you been to a GP for? related issues and, and they'd missed it or- i've been to the look i don't blame gps i think we've got enough problems in the nhs no, at the I, moment i but i i went with things like for example i started getting ha- heart arrhythmias and heart palpitations because of the coffee i started having to have regular thyroid checks because i was having three or four showers a day very common for people with restrictive eating disorders because basically food is food is fuel so i was constantly feeling cold i was always feeling tired but no one connected the dots and i don't blame anyone for that I think there needs to be more information out there that actually anorexia and eating disorders at large are not necessarily about food. For example, binge eating. That's nothing to do with food, exactly. So the your weight was what then? So I never actually give out specifics, but like, look, bottom line, I never looked. I never looked thin. And actually 65% of people with bulimia are a mid-range BMI. I think it's really important to say that eating disorders are a mental health issue rather than a physical aesthetic. But you were you were hospitalised. I, I ended up going in when I was 23. I ended up uh, going into treatment. I was under the care of the Morsley Hospital for two and a half years. Pamela Nugent uh, joins us, who uh, I'm sorry to say lost her son Lawrence in 2009 to an illness she believes was caused by his eating disorder and she set up the Lawrence Trust to to help others. So, uh, Pamela, thanks very much for coming on and we're very sorry for your loss. Do you know what the trigger was? No, we don't. As Dave said, it's a mental health issue and I'll be clear again and reiterate what Dave said. People think it's about body image. It isn't. Body image is the knee-jerk coping strategy that a person who is feeling very stressed and has mental health issues will turn to just like an alcoholic with alcohol or drug abuse or with drugs. We reckon Lawrence had probably started an eating disorder around 11 years of age. 
Okay, can I ask you what your take on that is, is Dave? I think it's a really good point. Was I think, there a trigger? Was there a trigger with you? No, I think bottom line, we can try and waste time trying to justify why we or someone else feels unwell, but actually, it's an accumulation of things. I think for me, it was a combination of when I started to lose weight, people kept on congratulating me, going, "Oh, well done." So obviously, putting on weight must meet must be bad. I also, that's kind of a body image thing. I think it's also a low self-esteem thing. If you if you get positive affirmation from something, then you're going to seek more and more of that. But that was only one part of the puzzle, I think, also as well. I'd got exams, coursework, university, everything fell out of my control. And if I could focus on calories, weights, exercises, that was something, again, that I could control. Also, I think in the short term, I didn't realise that what I was doing was in any way unhealthy. I didn't see the impact that it was having on larger things. So I always get worried when people sort of try and sort of Hollywood affy it by saying it, it was this one thing. Actually, that's not how life works. It's normally accumulation of things that are in the mix. So it's you know it's in, invariably sort of multi, yeah, multi causal as absolutely would say. So, but Pamela, in in your case, I'd, what could have happened that didn't happen? Unfortunately, what could have been different was Lawrence could have got the he- the healthcare provision, which he didn't get, and he could have maybe learned how to manage his eating disorder. Because you have to remember, as Dave said, there isn't one specific one thing that causes or triggers an eating disorder. And it isn't a quick fix, as all parents think it should be a quick fix. And parents blame themselves and they think it's their fault and they feel guilty they didn't do enough. Because we felt that and sometimes we still feel that. But what could have been different was him getting the understanding from uh, the health service. And again, like Dave, I'm not going to slate the health service because you have to remember this was 14 years ago now and the care and attention and the information about eating disorders in men was not there at that time. Um, And Dave, you're using comedy to try and help people suffering with eating disorders. Now, look, it might be my lack of imagination, but an obvious point to make is that I, you know, the... I can't quite see the comedic potential in it. Yeah, exactly. Especially when you hear heart-wrenching stories like Pam's. I think it's really important to say, firstly and foremostly, we're not laughing at people with eating disorders. Not, not. Um, what we're trying to do is Beat have got amazing support and help out there. You know, we've got emails, chat support, etc. And the Lawrence Trust are doing a brilliant thing. But look, waiting times are quite long at the moment. That's just the state we're in. Yeah. So we're using comedy, uh, a six-week comedy course online that's been funded by the British Academy and also Dr. D- De Klerk at the University of Kent has worked alongside this in order to help people prop up while they are on waiting lists to use comedy in order to build their confidence to get that communication so that when they do see a trained healthcare professional they can actually talk about it in a much better way and build that connection with other people okay i'll I'll give you the last word pamela obviously what's your what's what's your plea on this um what's your advice My advice, first of all, is that GPs need to get greater education and better informed when a person comes to them with eating disorders. And instead of, first of all, looking at body weight and bloods, look at the mental health, listen to that person, because it's taken great courage for them to go to the GP. And to parents, I would say parents, partners, carers, get informed. Uh, There's BEAT, as Dave has said. There is EDANI in Northern Ireland. There's plenty of support there in the voluntary community for parents and carers to understand about eating disorders to have greater support. And the person with eating disorder, find the courage to go and talk and find help. It's out there. Uh, Thanks very much indeed for your time, Pamela. That's Pamela Nugent uh, from the Lawrence Trust and also uh, Dave Chawner who uh, author and comedian who's working with them thank you all very much indeed listen on bbc sounds this is bbc radio 5 live